It is uh, March 28th, and uh, this is another installment of uh, Fun with Aviation here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum. I know you're all anticipating that we were going to be seeing the uh, YF-16 today, but frankly, the uh, it's just too windy outside and too noisy, and uh, so we're going to do a little indoor tour here this morning and uh, go through a little bit uh, of the aviation history of Fort Worth. So enough of me, we'll turn this around. Uh, the Fort Worth Aviation Museum is comprised of galleries telling the stories from a number of different groups. Uh, we have the OV-10 Bronco Association, which is our namesake group, and we have a gallery on the Bronco. Then we have the uh, Ford Air Controllers Museum, which is a broader story that the uh, OV-10 is a part of. And then the B-36 Peacemaker Museum is also here. In addition to that, our primary story here is the history of aviation in Fort Worth. And so we're going to go down this hallway and talk about some of that. Uh, this hallway's got a name. It's called the I Didn't Know That Hallway. We have so many people who come through here and just plain tell us that I didn't realize this. I didn't know that. So uh, first we're going to start off with, uh, with a little bit about Eamon Carter. Uh, Eamon Carter was one of the, uh, the primary proponents of aviation here in Fort Worth. He wasn't the earliest and uh, he was not necessarily the only one but he was very prominent and it goes back to the 20s right after the first world war when he saw the benefit of aviation and created what was referred to as the fort worth aviation club it was much like a cattleman's club or an oilman's club or any other uh, uh, business association club and the intent was to promote aviation uh, here in the local area which uh, ended up uh, with the result of Meacham Airport where we are today, which is one of the oldest airports in the country. It was established in 1925. I want to tell you a little bit about Eamon. Most people think of him as, a, uh, as an editor or an oilman or even a collector of Western art, but he was also uh, very prominent in uh, promoting aviation here. Uh, this picture, as you can see, shows a little bit of uh, all of the different airplanes, starting with the, the Blario 11 down in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, going up to some of the more modern ones. This picture is uh, from back in the uh, in the 80s, I believe. So it shows a lot of what is the result of that first flight that took place here uh, in 1911. Uh, the American Airlines uh, administration and hangar building that was here was restored by Mr. Robert Bass a few years ago. Uh, it was originally built in 1933, as you can see from this plaque, and it was dedicated to Eamon Carter. This is the original plaque that was on the hangar that's been donated to us by, uh, by Mr. Robert Bass. Now one of the first things that uh, where Eamon got involved with uh, aviation was with the Travel Air 5000. Uh, back in the, in the early 20s, aviation uh, was just starting to, uh, to become well known after the First World War and commercial aviation was, uh, was taking uh, was starting to take its place here locally. A company called National Air Transport uh, wanted to use Fort Worth as part of its hub and its transcontinental uh, flying operations. So they originally started here with the uh, Travel Air 5000, which was one of the earliest airplanes uh, built for the purpose of, of commercial travel. Uh, it would carry all of four passengers along with the pilot, and it quickly was replaced by bigger airplanes because even though we had the depression of the late 20s and early 30s, aviation literally took off and was what was promoting business uh, across the country. So this picture here is Mr. E.P. Lott from uh, National Air Transport gifting one of these Travel Air 5000s to Eamon Carter. He took the airplane over to his, his ranch and there it sat for a long, long time. You'll notice there's a fence around it and that there's a, there's a cow out next to the fence. Well, the fence was not, to protect, uh, was not to protect the airplane, it was to protect the cow. But after a number of years, the airplane just sat and deteriorated to the point where it just really became a skeleton. Back several years ago, we learned by, uh, by looking up the serial number that the airplane still existed and started an effort to uh, try to bring the airplane home here to Fort Worth. We were successful in doing that. Uh, Mr. Robert Simpson uh, purchased the airplane and it was taken to, uh, to Justin, Texas at uh, Prop Wash where uh, Cowtown Aircrafters did a restoration on the airplane to this condition and it's now up in the, uh, 
the old Star Telegram press room. So that's uh, that's one of the things that was done to commemorate the things that uh, some of the things that Eamon Carter did. He made sure that this was a a place where if there was any air travel that took place through the Southwest, it had to come through Fort Worth. Some of the original things that aviation did was con uh, carry contract airmail. And so it coincided with the trains and everything else here. But National Air Transport used to promote that you could have breakfast in Fort Worth and you could have dinner in Chicago. National Air Transport, by the way, later became United Airlines or part of United Airlines. One of the things that uh, that Eamon was very fond of was uh, Pan Am uh, Clipper flights. You see in this particular picture, you'll see Juan Tripp, who was also part of Southern Air Transport, which was early, uh, one of the early airlines in uh, the American Airlines uh, lineage. Um, in fact, this is him right here, and there's Eamon, always with the hat, right? So at any rate, this was when they were in Hawaii, but Eamon used to go on all of the inaugural flights on the Pan Am Clippers when they went to uh, when they went to Asia or when they went to Europe. And so these are some of the first flight day uh, covers that Eamon sent back home. So there's the Yankee Clipper and there's the Philippine Clipper and there's the crew and there's some more of that. So Eamon had a lot to do with furthering aviation here in North Texas and promoting it over the years, uh, especially the commercial aviation aspect which started to take place. Now right below that, which is not necessarily part of our, our lineage or our story here, but it certainly is here at the museum. This is the condition that most of the airplanes that we've gotten here come in. The, the 105, as you can see on the left, uh, virtually just a hulk. Most of them come into us on, on trucks and the F-111. If you've been here, uh, you know that uh, now both of these airplanes, after about seven to nine years uh, of restoration, uh, look like they are ramp ready to take off. But we're going to continue down the hall. We're going to stay on the right side of the hallway here this morning. Uh, the left side is the forward air controllers uh, story, and we're going to leave that for another rainy day. Uh, here's a little bit of a map of the Metroplex to give you some idea of, of some of the things that have taken place here in the Metroplex. Uh, if we go from uh, the bottom left and the bottom picture, those are representations of Carruthers Field in Benbrook and uh, Barron Field uh, uh, near Emmerman. These were two of the three, and up in the farther right-hand corner, you'll see uh, Tolliver Field at Hicks Station. Those were the three Royal Air Force, Royal Flying Corps airfields that were established here in World War I to help train uh, Canadian pilots as well as American pilots. Now, here's the Easter egg for today. When these originally uh, were built, they were built and they were referred to as uh, Tolliver 1, 2, and 3. And it's spelled Taliaferro, but it's pronounced Tolliver. The field at Barron, at uh, Barron Field near Everman had another name. And if somebody can tell me what that other name was, then we'll have a prize for them. After the First World War, all of these fields were closed. During the Second World uh, War, however, the one at Hicks was reopened for, uh, for training there. In addition uh, to World War II, Lake Worth was turned into a, uh, was turned into a seaport uh, for the flying boats that were, were bought by Consolidated and were being taken cross country uh, and taken all the way over to Great Britain. When uh, Eamon Carter was gotten in, in contact with by Boom Trenchard and uh, they wanted to know if, uh, I'm sorry, not Boom Trenchard, uh, but he was contacted by Consolidated and uh, was uh, wondering if, if it would be possible to rest the airplanes in Fort Worth. They were concerned about hurricanes on the, uh, the Gulf Coast. So Eamon Carter took that letter and went down to uh, the city council and within nine days we had a seaport, a fully functional seaport here. You can see down on the bottom the piers and the maintenance buildings and then the, and then the uh, anchorages. Uh, Try to get anything done anywhere in any city in nine days anymore is difficult. Uh, also during the Second World War, uh, Eagle Mountain Lake was used as Marine Corps Air Station Eagle Mountain Lake to train Grumman uh, F-7F pilots and they also did some experimentation with some amphibious gliders uh, which was a failure and that was a, probably a good thing for everybody. Um, Meacham Field or Fort Worth was the only place during the Second World War that had major military installations for uh, all of the services. The Marine Corps at Eagle Mountain Lake, 
and then the Army Airfield at uh, uh, here at Carswell, and then Hensley Field over in Dallas for the Navy. Now uh, here's a here's another uh, here's a, here's another Easter egg for you. Um, Marine Corps Air Station <coughs> Eagle Mountain Lake was a part of a Marine Aviation Wing, a MAW. Uh, if somebody can tell me which uh, Marine Air Wing it was in, uh, we'll give you a prize on that one. So later on, during the 50s, we had three uh, Nike missile batteries. So I'm sorry, four Nike missile batteries around uh, around the Metroplex. One up north by Denton. There's another one uh, out west, uh, and then there was another one down at Alvarado and then another one near Lancaster. And uh, so those have all been abandoned, but we had those surrounding the, f the area. And then Greater Southwest Airport came into being in the 50s uh, through the late 60s. So that's just a little bit of, uh, of some of the activity that took place here in the, uh, in the Metroplex. We're gonna move down the way here a little bit, and here's, uh, here's Meacham, uh, a little bit about Meacham Airport. Started in 1925, was named Meacham uh, Meacham Airport in 1927 after the mayor, H.C. Meacham. Okay, I'm, good. I'm hearing some, somebody, Camp Talia Farrell. Yeah, the, it was referred to as Camp Talia Farrell here in Fort Worth, and then it had the three, uh, the three distinct airfields. Uh, Lindbergh landed here in 27 after his, uh, his world-famous flight. And then we had the American Airways hangar, Built in 1933, and it still exists today, but it has been completely refurbished. Uh, quite, of a, quite a beautiful building now, uh, and that was done by, uh, by Mr. Robert Bass. You'll also notice uh, FASH Foundation is listed on our, uh, on our posters here. The FASH Foundation has been very supportive of, of this museum and our educational programs, and so we are, uh, we're very grateful for Linda FASH Bush's uh, assistance here in helping with us. The original terminal building, which was one of the most modern in the country when it was built, uh, was gone away a long time ago, but the American Airways uh, building still exists today. A little bit more, here's some uh, pictures from Meacham Field. Uh, there's Lindbergh upper in the upper left-hand corner. Braniff Airways flew out of here for quite a while. That's what the airport looked like when it was first established. That was the first hangar. Uh, down here we have an auto gyro. There was a, uh, a cavalcade that took place here in the 30s, and that was one of the airplanes that uh, Eamon Carter uh, flew in along with his son. Uh, and he also uh, did a lot of flying with, uh, with Howard Hawks and eventually was uh, actually given the Hawks Award in the 50s. So then there's the destruction of the, uh, of the beautiful glass tower that was the, uh, the control tower here at Meacham. Jennies, the uh, Jennies were here for a long time after the First World War. A lot of the pilots, after they, uh, after they finished flying, they wanted to keep going. And so they bought some of these, uh, the Jennies, and started some of the early flying with that, whether it was flying circuses or barnstorming, uh, or whether it was carrying pack passengers uh, around, uh, around the countryside. But eventually, uh, uh, those kind of grew into airlines. And uh, the gentleman here in the glasses is H.C. Meacham. He's the person the airport is named after. Now, we do have a timeline here. We're not going to run the whole timeline, but uh, it just goes along with significant events that have taken place in the world and here in Fort Worth from 1900 to today. Some of the interesting side stories here and uh, that people come in and say, I didn't know about that, was this particular story. And this is the Aztec Eagles. This is Squadron 201 of the Mexican Air Force. Uh, during the Second World War, Mexico was, uh, was considered to be uh, neutral until the Germans sunk a couple of their, uh, a couple of their oil tankers in the Gulf. And uh, with that, they decided that they would take the side of the Allies. And a lot of them, uh, they had very little in the way their Air Force was, uh, was kind of just growing and brand new. So they came up here and they did a lot of their initial training here uh, with the Squadron 201, the Aztec Eagles. Uh, they were initially, or they were eventually trained to fly the P-47s. And they actually flew in combat here in the Philippines uh, in the P-47s. You'll notice it's got the, uh, the green, white, and red tail on the airplanes. So let's see, uh, we've also used QR codes here uh, so that people can can get a little bit more in-depth information, but here's some of the pilots 
with their P-47s. Uh, one of the things that they were surprised about when they came up here, some of their instructors were, uh, were women, which was very unusual uh, for those folks. And uh, it was WASPs, it was members of the WASP organization that, that did some of the uh, target towing for them and some of the transport and a little bit of the training. And they, uh, they were surprised that they had, uh, had women as instructors, but they said they were very pretty, so it was okay. One of the early aviation stories that we have here is Bessie Coleman. Uh, Bessie Coleman, uh, as you can see, 1892 to 1926. Bessie was born in Atlanta, Texas, which is over near Waxahachie. Uh, I'm sure that with part of the uh, early aviation that took place here, that she saw some of the airplanes that were flying all over the area during the First World War, and that's what inspired her to want to learn to fly. Uh, but as she tried to learn to fly here in Texas, no one would allow her to. Uh, she was a black woman and she was a woman, so it was not, uh, not considered uh, uh, appropriate here. But people told her if you go to Chicago uh, up north, they might be a lot more tolerant and you'd be able to go ahead and learn to fly up there. Well, she did that and it didn't happen. But she was also learned there that the French may be a lot more tolerant and if she learned French, she might be able to uh, go to France and learn to, uh, learn to fly, which she did. And as you can see here, this is a copy of her, of her license. Uh, it was given to her uh, on uh, 15, uh, 15 June 1921, uh, she, and Bessie Coleman is the, uh, the, first, uh, the first black female pilot in the world. She came back here, became known as Queen Bess, used the ever-present uh, Jenny, and uh, did a lot of flying around the area, but was killed in, uh, in an accident in 1926, April 30th, 1926. One of the other famous stories from, uh, from here is the endurance flight uh, done, by, uh, done by James Kelly and, uh, and Reg Robbins in 1929. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, endurance flights that were taking place about that, uh, that point in time. Uh, the military was, uh, was in the lead on these things and doing it, but here locally, Reg Robbins and, uh, uh, and James Kelly decided that they, could want, they wanted to try to do it here. Well. This was all by, by Reg. James Kelly was a mechanic, and they set out to, uh, to do the endurance flight. And uh, so they did that with this, uh, with this, with this old air, air, airplane. It's Orion, it's a and it, was not, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't new. It wasn't anything special like, uh, like the military was using. But they managed to fly for 172 hours and 32 minutes, uh, beating by a day a previous record that was set five months earlier. Now what they did is they, they kind of stayed right here over Meacham because they were concerned that people were going to say, well, you flew off someplace and landed and then just come, didn't come back. But as you can see here, they were doing aerial refueling. This is one of the, the first attempts at aerial refueling. They would also pass baskets with newspapers and food and things like that to them back and forth. Now James Kelly from time to time would have to get out and he would have to go ahead and oil the engine. So there was a, a catwalk on the side of the airplane and he would get out of the airplane, go up to the front behind that spinning propeller and oil and do some uh, minor maintenance on the engines. Well, the only reason that they stopped at 172 hours is when the first time he, one of the first times he went out to do that, his belt buckle flicked out and nicked the prop. And over the course of that 172 hours, uh, the prop started to fail, it started to crack and they started to get vibrations and they decided they just, they had to land uh, otherwise, they felt they could have gone for a lot longer time. So what we're going to do here is go around and show you a little bit of the timeline. Uh, quickly, we're going to go back to uh, first flight time. And this is where our timeline in the museum story starts, because we go all around here. And I'm going to go slower so and show you all of this. Then the timeline picks up over here in the 40s and goes around to the current day. But today we're only going to work with first flight up through about 1930 or so. First flight took place here on January 12th, 19, uh, 1911. Uh, Roland Garros, uh, one of the pilots who was here, along with uh, the Moissant aviators that were considered an international flight group, they were really a flying circus at that point in time. They, uh, uh, they would go from, uh, from city to city promoting aviation. They would go on trains. Uh, because the airplanes couldn't fly that far and there really weren't any airfields. So they would do things like uh, when they came here to Fort Worth, some of you may re recognize the Montgomery Ward building from back in the 20s, but behind it you'll see a racetrack. 
So this was a racetrack, it was called a driving park, and it was right next to the railroad, so it made it very convenient for them to bring the airplanes in and set up their grandstands and be able to promote their, uh, uh, promote their flying show. Now, right across a, a while ago, uh, several years ago, uh, we worked with the uh, city of Fort Worth and the Texas Historical Commission, and uh, we went ahead and had a Texas Historical Commission marker established. When you do that here in Texas, you have to get the permission of the landowner to be able to plant the marker. So what we, what we did is we found, a, we found a piece of ground that was right across the street from the park. In fact, I can show you right here. It's just about over in here, right across the street from the park that had never been built on. It was a donated to the city in 1943 uh, for a park and the city never really made a park out of it. So we found that uh, it was still vacant in fact, nothing had ever been built on it, so we felt fairly certain that somebody, that people stood on that ground and watched the flight. And working with the city and local developers uh, and the parks department, uh, we established or helped establish with the city First Flight Park, which exists today with a uh, full-scale uh, full scale replica of the Blario 11, which sits up on top of that pedestal. And uh, we think it's probably the largest wind vane in Texas because it sits there and it bobs around in the wind. So we're, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we were able to uh, preserve that part of the local history and, uh, and tell that story to people. Now, also about the same time was a coast-to-coast -coast flight. Uh, it was done by uh, Cal Rogers uh, Vin Fizz and, um, uh, was, a, was a sponsor of his airplane, but uh, William Randolph Hearst made, a, uh, made an offer, a contest. Anybody who could fly, from, uh, could fly cross country in 30 days or less, he would give them $50,000. Well, in 1912, that was a lot of money, lots and lots of money. So at any rate, Cal Rogers starts up here in, uh, in Sheephead Bay, New York, and essentially follows railroad tracks. Uh, with, this, uh, with his airplane, which is, was a Wright Flyer. It was the first one that they had sold to a civilian, and they were sponsored by Vin Fizz, which was a, uh, which was a soda drink. And he came through Fort Worth and then continued on and made his way all the way out to Long Beach. Now, the only part of the airplane that, uh, that made the entire trip was the oil pan. Uh, everything else had been replaced as, uh, as they went cross country. He had one of the Wright Brothers mechanics with him. And uh, there was another gentleman, oh, he was the first one to do it, but he didn't win the money because it took him closer to 90 days to do it as opposed to, uh, as opposed to 30 days. So he didn't win the prize. Another gentleman started from, uh, started from the West Coast and his intent was to come across and go to Florida and his name was Robert Fowler. Uh, you, that name may be familiar to you and, and he, uh, we believe he had something to do with the invention of the Fowler flaps. But he had a two-place airplane and he took a lot longer. He took months and months to come across, and primarily because every place he stopped, people wanted, had not seen airplanes and wanted to, uh, wanted to have an opportunity to see an airplane and ride in it. So he gave rides all the way across, uh, landed, in, uh, landed in all kinds of little places. Uh, at one point in time, he landed out by El Paso. He was forced down in the sand. And one of the stories goes that uh, after he was fixed, he couldn't get the airplane to fly. He couldn't get enough speed up in the sand to get it to fly. But he was right next to the railroad tracks, and they found a hand car. So they put the airplane on a hand car and started pumping it up and down along the tracks until it got to be uh, got enough speed on the tracks that he could fly. And apparently, as the story goes, it was just in time because there was a train coming the other way. Uh, he ended up coming through uh, through Fort Worth in this area. Went down through. Uh, uh, went down through, uh, through Waco and that area. And uh, instead of going up north, he ended up in, uh, in Florida. But we don't tell too much of that story. But here's Cal with his airplane and a representation of the Vin Fizz bottle. But now here's where aviation really gets its, uh, gets its start here in Fort Worth. And it's with this gentleman and the first Aero Squadron. Uh, this gentleman is Benjamin Falloy. And uh, this is a, f I'm gonna step back a little bit because this is a full-size replica of Benjamin Falloy. He was not a big person, but most of the aviators weren't in those days. They were moving the airplanes from Fort Sill down to San Antonio and were looking for places to stop with the airplanes en route. And uh, this was in, in 1915. Of course, the war had been going on in Europe since 1914. 
at the beginning of the war, there were 750 airplanes in the entire world. By the end of the war, there were over 250,000. And uh, uh, of course, the US Air Force at this point in time was this, six airplanes. That was it. That was the sum total of all of the airplanes that uh, the US Air Force or the Army Air Corps Signal Corps had. Well, Benjamin Falloy and his pilots came through here on their way and stopped, and a gentleman named Benny Keith uh, welcomed them, and they put them up and entertained them for a couple of days. And uh, if you're from Texas, you should know who Benny Keith is. You see his trucks, big white trucks that say Benny Keith on them. He's the large, Benny Keith Corporation is one of the largest distributors of uh, Budweiser beer and food and things. Back in that period of time, uh, there was mostly just here in the Fort Worth area. But, uh, but Ben was, uh, was a, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, or the head of the Chamber of Commerce, and he wanted to show these people uh, Fort Worth and what they could do here. So they landed in the same place, uh, in the same place that uh, uh, over at Ryan Place, uh, the Ryan Place neighborhood in Fort Worth, which is the same place that Cal Rogers had landed uh, a few years before. So they landed there, and then they went on their business and went down to, uh, went down to San Antonio. Now, a side story on that is that one of the newest technologies of the day were trucks. And they had trucks that they were using to bring all of their, uh, all of their equipment and things from Fort Sill down in San Antonio. Well, one of the things that, uh, that they found out is that none of the bridges in Texas were stressed for a truck. They were stressed for wagons and horses, but not a truck. So every truck that came across every bridge in Texas uh, broke it down by the time they, uh, they got down to San Antonio. So I can see we're running on about a half an hour, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this uh, a little bit quick. From there, what happened during the, uh, during the First World War, as that, uh, as that started up, uh, we established, uh, we had about 25 to 30 percent of all of the aviation training for the First World War took place here in Texas. And as I mentioned, we had three airfields ourselves, and this is pretty much what they, what they all looked like. And they were flying jennies, like the airplanes down here and like the airplanes up here. But after the, uh, after the war was over, uh, after the war was over, that developed into, uh, or I'm sorry, let me go back. When uh, there, there became a need for the airfields, and we knew that the Canadians wanted to come out of the, out of the cold and wanted to come down here, to, uh, uh, down here to, uh, to a warmer place to train. So uh, Benny Keith went to Washington and found his friend Benjamin Falloy and uh, offered him uh, Fort Worth as a place where they could do the training. Uh, Benjamin was getting ready to, uh, to head over to France, so he wrote on, a, uh, on a, a cigarette paper, do what you can do or do what you can to help this Texan and handed it to General Huthbert Cora, Cora who was uh, the head of the Royal Flying Corps in Canada. Uh, Huth or Cuthbert actually wanted the, uh, the training to take place down in San Antonio, but he was concerned about how much, uh, uh, how much labor force was available down there. So he decided to, uh, at first he wanted to go down there, not, not Fort Worth, but then realized that there might not be enough people in the San Antonio area. So he did, in fact, uh, bring the flying up here. All of the cities up here, Dallas, Waco, Mineral Wells, Fort Worth, uh, everybody wanted one of these airfields. But it was announced about a week later that Fort Worth would get all three. And as Benjamin Keith would say, he made more deals over, over dinner and drinks than he ever did across a, uh, a desk. So, okay, we're down here. We've been, been about a half an hour. So I'm going to just kind of back up, let you see a little bit more of the, uh, the Fort Worth room here. And uh, plenty more stories to tell here. And uh, we will do that on, a, on another day. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to you, uh, the YF-16 to you today, but we'll do that. Uh, we'll try to get that done either Wednesday or next Saturday. Uh, we hope you're all being safe, and, uh, and, and I'm obviously doing my social distancing. There's nobody here today but me. And uh, you may notice there's a little donate uh, button up above, uh, up above the page here. Uh, we're not looking for a handout. We're just looking for a hand. And so if it's tough times for everybody, but if you can spare a dollar or two and uh, you find that these, uh, these videos and the contests are running are, are entertaining and you're getting some value out of them, uh, we would be happy with uh, any, any small, uh, small donation you might be willing to share with us. Like I said, even a dollar or two helps because we don't have visitors, but our bills keep coming in. So for now, I'm going to tell you thanks for stopping in today. Hope you've enjoyed this uh, session of Fun with Aviation. 
and we'll look forward to seeing you on uh, Wednesday. Thanks, folks.